steps to create your design plan. And um, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm Ann Yasalanis, the Horticulture Extension Agent and Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator with UFI Physics Extension in Polk County. And um, Sue is the Master Gardener Volunteer assisting today. So she's letting you in and muting people and um, monitoring the chat. And she will post um, the links that we discuss as, as she can find them uh, in the chat box. Um, so if you've been in before, you haven't, um, this is what it looks like. And just if you have questions or you have issues um, hearing something, uh, you can type into the chat. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear and see okay, but you can use that chat to ask questions at any time. Um, and we'll take all the questions. I'll take questions from last week here in a minute, but then the rest of the questions we'll take at the very end of the, um, the webinar today. Um, and we will put a link in the chat to the evaluation at the end. Um, obviously, we welcome any feedback at any time. So um, we want to make sure we're, we're getting you everything that you need um, uh, as far as whatever topic we're teaching. So any feedback is helpful. I mean, if you feel like you could have used a lot more information as far as landscape design, you know, let, let me know um, what we're missing. We always want to, you know, continue to make it better. And we are recording it. Um, and hopefully we'll have it posted. So in the last two webinars, we talked about inventory in your yard and making an assessment about what you have and what you want to accomplish by creating a landscape design plan. And this is the final webinar and we're going to discuss how to get everything that we talked about in the previous two uh, sessions um, on paper. Okay. Um, if you have anything you want to share from um, last week or even the week before, so last week we did a lot of talking about design principles. Um, if you want to share anything or have any questions on the past um, two webinar topics, I'll go ahead and take those now. So if you want to post in the chat um, anything that we need to answer before we move on, or you're welcome to unmute yourself now and ask as well. Uh, great, we found the YouTube channel. I know it has a funny long link. There should be a direct link to it, but I'd have to, I'll have to pull it. But um, yes, thank you. Anybody have any questions on the past couple? Okay, so if you do have any that pop up as we're going along, again, you can type them in the chat. Okay, so we're going to be talking today about creating your landscape plan. So we'll be talking a lot about um, how to get everything on paper at this point. Okay, so this is our final step in creating a plan. Oh, did somebody have a question. Um, oh, there's a question. I'll grab this real quick. Uh, plant to safely hide your air conditioning unit. Um, yep. And as we move into our plot plan here, we'll talk about, you know, we talked about in the inventory and analysis, um, everything that stays in your landscape is going on this main plan. So your air conditioner unit, most likely people aren't changing that or where it's located. So that's going to be on your plan. Um, and um, hiding that can be done in a couple of different ways um, with some fencing, with shrubbery. The main thing to remember about um, hiding any utilities, um, if they have to be accessed, you want there to be plenty of space to get to them. And then really with the AC, you want you know, air to be able to circulate around it. Um, so maybe a shade tree nearby that could provide shade yet not be planted very closely to it. Hopefully that answers that question. Okay, so we're going to create our plot plan. It would kind of look something similar to what we see on the screen here. Um, and we're going to be using measurements, real measurements, from either the property appraiser. You can get some measurements there. You're not going to get everything from the property appraiser. You may have house plans from home purchase um, if, you, if you were given those. Um, or if you built a home, you should have a layout of your whole property. 
and there'll be measurements on there. There may be some missing as well. And you can certainly take your own measurements as well. Um, and they don't need to be down to the inch or anything like that. And really, if you can um, get a pretty good estimate of what your stride is with your feet, um, you can do some measuring that way as well. Um, so just kind of get to the closest foot, um, I think is accurate enough. It can get real tricky to get to the closest inch. Um, but you should be able to utilize a couple of different things to get those measurements for you. Um, and you can see here, this is an entire property. If you're thinking about just redesigning the front yard or the backyard or, or you know, a small segment of the landscape, you do not have to put everything on paper. But if you think years down the road, you might want to, um, this is a pretty big job. And so you may want to take the time to do it all at once now and just say, okay, well, I'm just going to design the front for now. And, you know, maybe in a couple of years, I'll design the back, but I've got it all laid out at this time. Okay. So it can be a little bit time consuming to get some measurements. Again, just be as close as you can. Um, and everything that's relevant to the area you're designing will be on this. So you can see all of, again, all of the examples here, telephone pole, air conditioning unit, driveway, you know, all those inventory things. Um, some things that I like that are on this one is you can see where they've indicated an easement. So while you're allowed to plant an easement many times, um, you maybe don't want to do something super elaborate because if a city or county to come into an easement, they can pull everything out. Um, and then also you'll see in the back where they've indicated where the septic tank is. Also might be important to know where your drain field is because um, if, for example, like on this plan, your drain field is where those trees are, probably not a good idea to have trees or even be planting more trees over your drain field. Um, also, if you're considering part of your plan to be adding a pool, you know, you don't want to be putting that over a septic tank or a drain field or, or things like that. So those are also really important things to have water lines, gas lines. You can certainly get everything marked um, by utilities. It's um, Sunshine State 811 is who you call and then they contact all of your utilities to get everything marked and it's free before you dig. If you wanna put all those lines on your plan, you can get that marked at any time and they'll come out and put flags and, and paint. Um, so if you wanna have that done now, you can go ahead and get that marked and, and you'll have that, that on there. Okay, so we're, we're measuring everything. Um, and then when we put it on our paper, it's gonna be done to scale. And that means that a foot of measurement in real life will equal a smaller scale measurement on your paper. So for example, if you decide that one foot in real life will actually each equal a half an inch on your paper, um, you'll get um, you'll make sure everything fits properly and is to scale, if that makes sense. Um, one of the easiest ways to do this is to use graph paper. Um, you can buy kind of notebooks of graph paper um, that will work for you. If you have a huge lot that you're putting on, that can be tricky and you may have to purchase a piece of, you know, 24 by 36 or 18 by 24 inch graph paper um, to fit everything. But a lot of times I've found that the small booklet of graph paper that's, I think you buy it in a, maybe a, um, eight and a half by 17, I believe. And then the little squares have a pre-measurement on them. So for that, I've done a lot of plans where one square on the graph paper equals one foot in real life. So it makes counting and designing really easily because it's a one-to-one -one type of thing. And you can do that with the larger graph paper too. Again, if you've got hundreds of feet of property line, it just might be that you're scaling it down way too small to get it on um, an eight and a half by 17 piece of paper. And that would be the only reason to size up to a larger um, graph paper. And you can buy single large pieces of graph paper at like blueprint stores. Um, I'm assuming you can probably buy it at like a um, office supply store as well. Um, but I've gone into blueprint stores before and just bought, you know, one single sheet of 24 by 36 graph paper, you know, for $3 or something like that. Okay. So that's, this is a, um, a time consuming thing that we're going to do. We're going to get everything on paper. Um, so I'm gonna look at some of the comments and questions because this is, this is one of the harder things to do is to get everything on the paper. So um, 
graph paper book and paper found in Walmart with school supplies. That's a good point. Uh, right now with school supplies out, you might be able to find more graph paper um, out. And again, my main point with using a graph paper, if you're using a one foot to one inch or you know whatever the one square mark on your graph paper, just make sure that it's something that you can read and it doesn't make your design teeny tiny. Um, and land, uh, apps on phones for using, uh, for creating a landscape plan, there probably are some. Um, I don't know of any off the top of my head. Um, really, this is the simplest way to get something done fairly quickly. Um, but if you find an app or something you think is really easy to use, um, you know, send it my way and I can take a look at it and maybe it'll help other people also. Um, and then someone also mentioned you can print graph paper if you Google it. That's a, that's a good idea also. Um, there may be simply just apps that are, you know, graph paper <laughs> apps. I'm not sure, but um, it seems like something that would be, what would be possible. Um, but that's really the cheapest and simplest way to do it. And, you know, if you're using paper, you can make photocopies or erase things pretty easily as well. So, um, but the main thing is you're getting everything to scale. And it doesn't really matter what it looks like as long as you can understand it and know that my one square graph paper is one foot of my yard and you know it's easy to make measurements that way. There are lots of um, uh, rulers that you can use. There's architect scale and that sort of thing that I have used in the past, but it's just the simplest thing to do to just you know do that one-to-one -one on your graph paper for sure. Um, if you do have questions on Use any of the scales, um, you can let me know. Also using graph paper will keep everything nice and straight on your, your plan also. Okay, so once you've completed that plan, um, you don't wanna have to do it again. <laughs> it, it, it's not a very exciting thing to do lots of measurements and things for most people. So from here forward, I would suggest you either make photocopies of it, a couple of them, or as you move forward with your design, you use a thinner like tracing paper over it to do any of your design experimentation with bed lines and laying out plants and walkways and stuff like that. Um, so you wanna have a master copy of your plot plan um, that you retain just in case, cause you don't wanna be redrawing that a, a bunch of times. Um, and if you use big graph paper, you can get big graph paper copies done at you know any copy place um, pretty inexpensively. Um, so you're going to start your design by using pencil to create lines for your landscape beds and once you're happy with those you can go in and start to add circles or shapes to represent plants and you can kind of see how some of these are done here. Um, as you draw in landscape beds um, you're drawing them to scale remember again. So you may want to go check your measurements. So if you are say drawing on this piece of paper and you're like, okay, I really like how this line looks. It looks really nice on paper. Um, and then maybe you want to just double check the measurements. Okay. I drew it on paper. I like it. It's, you know, 10 feet wide. Let me go outside and see what that looks like to make sure realistically I like a 10 foot wide bed, um, that sort of thing. So you can go out and double just check and see if you like everything. And one of the easiest ways to do that is if you have a garden hose, um, you can do some quick measurements, maybe off the corner of the porch, the corner of the house, and kind of just lay out a garden hose to mimic what those new bed lines would look like to make sure that, you know, what you see on paper and what you see in real life, you, you like them both. Because again, when we're drawing this on paper, the idea is that yes, this will be what you put in your landscape and you're going to purchase the number of plants that fit into that bed. And so you don't want to either, you know, purchase not enough or too many plants. And so that'll help you, um, you know, spend the right amount of money that you need to spend when you go in to make these purchases. So we want to make sure we're doing all this accurately. Um, so even the size of the plant shapes you put in your plan, those are going to be the scale of the mature size of the plant that you're putting in. And that's how you're gonna get your real count of the plants you need to purchase. So for example, if you look in this, this plant here and there's that little cluster of um, three plants off the left side of the porch there, they have kind of the X's in the middle. And that's just to delineate that that's a grouping of three plants that are different from the grouping of three plants that are next to it. That's usually why you see shading or, or something in a plant just to show that it's a different group of plants. So if you're looking at those three plants there, um, 
let's say they're Kunti cycads and they're going to be um, about four feet round when they're mature. Well, they're not going to be that big when you put them in, but we're drawing them in so that we know that we are planting them and spacing them um, the right way in the landscape. Um, and if you didn't do that to scale, you may accidentally not know how many to purchase and buy six instead of three. And so you've spent double the money and then later on down the line, maybe your landscape is too crowded. Um, so that's why we're drawing everything to scale here. Okay, so we're gonna show you some examples. Here's an example of a curved lines for landscape mulch beds. And you can see the plant circles and groups are showing the plant spacing, mature size. And then again, this is gonna help you with your count. And there's lots of ways that you can do this. And the main, the main point of putting in these circles in groupings um, are so that you can get an accurate count when you go to purchase plants. Um, so you may decide you wanna do little circles and put an X of all of the Kunti cycads and then you can get a count of those. Um, you may just decide you wanna say, um, I'm putting all the Kunti cycads in an X and I'm shading them green and then the plants next to them, even though they're the same size, I'm gonna shade them all purple just so I can say, get a, an accurate count if that is what makes sense. Um, the circles are drawn um, with a circle, kind of a, a template type thing like a ruler would be. Um, so that would be something to purchase. If you do not wanna purchase that, you have graph paper. And so you can draw your plants as squares. That is not a problem. Um, so if you know that um, a plant is gonna be four feet wide and tall, you can count out in your little squares, one, two, three, four wide and one, two, three, four the other way and just make a square. And again, the main point is to get your accurate count and be able to read your plan. It doesn't have to be a piece of art. I mean, you certainly can get creative and make it really pretty and fun, but you wanna be able to use it. And if that's the easiest way for you to use it and not have to purchase additional tools, then I think that is totally fine. And then you can see where sometimes people kind of make an outline around a plant grouping. So that plant grouping that's on the far right there, it's just a kind of outline of circles and you can see all the little dots in it. So that shows that that's a grouping of the same plant. And then if you were to take a count of all the plants there, you would simply count those little dots. The dots would be kind of like the center of the plant when planted. Okay, so there's a couple different ways you can do that. Um, here you can see where tracing paper was used to practice outlining mulched beds. Um, usually tracing paper comes in a roll. You can create plant beds and outline mulch to your heart's content here. Um, some of the things I would point out as you're looking at this is um, there's lots of curved lines here. So they've made lots of different ex experimental kind of bed lines. And um, I would say just double check after you draw those that, um, you know, again, it's to scale. So you can do some counting and say, oh, well, between this bed and this bed, I've only left a half a foot. That's not a great amount to try and mow. So I need to change it so that um, any of my lawn area is easy to mow and access and that I can get my mower, like we talked about in some of the previous webinars. I can get my mower there. Um, I can get a weed whacker in there. I can easily irrigate without lots of issues and making changes to you know, the lawn sprinklers or something like that. And again, um, with all of this, you know, go out into the landscape and lay out some garden hoses or, I mean, really you can also take um, spray paint and make some spray paint bed lines. You know, that'll come off the next time the lawn is mowed. Um, and that helps you kind of visualize it in person as well. So, um, you know, just, just have some fun with it. It is fun to create bed lines and see some of the different things that you can do. So we talked a lot last week about color and that sort of thing and, and texture and combining that in the landscape. And so um, one of the ways that this design was done was you can see there's kind of groupings in, of colored plants. So it could be the color of the flowers or the color of the foliage, whatever. So if you have some sort of uh, design principle as far as the color palette that you're gonna be using, um, doing something like this shading might be helpful to you. So. Um, 
instead of, of starting with circles of plants, they've um, created zones of color um, or shrubs. Um, and then, so for example, that, that front yellow clump there, um, you may know that you want a yellow, something that's flowering yellow here in the front next to um, a blue flowered plant. And you can make that shaded area there so you know that kind of general measurement of where you want those yellow plants to be. And then go over top of that and then make your little circles over top of the yellow. And I'll show you that in the next picture. So that's one way to do it if you want to really be able to see the color plan on your plot plan. So you can see here where they went from the color blocks to becoming the plants. Um, so this is one way to do it. You don't have to shade with color or anything, but if you'd like to, this is an easy way to design. And again, you don't have to worry about color circles being perfect or even being circles as long as you can count. And I think here you can easily see how if we go from this previous slide, we see that yellow kind of uh, blocked area in the landscape and we go to the next slide and we can see where they've taken that area where they know they want yellow flowers and broken it down into those individual plants whatever the plant that they selected would be and you could go in there and count one two three four five um, to get the number of plants that you would need to purchase for that area all right now it's getting fancy so here you can see distinct outlines of each plant and it's also been shaded so you can see how color is working in the landscape. And you could even make some distinctions to help you see different forms and texture also. Um, again, this is getting more artistic, which is great for some people, but some people not, are not interested in that. So it's again, totally up to you. Um, I think you could certainly stop at that previous slide and that would be totally fine to just have your little yellow circles to know that you're putting a two foot, uh, tall and wide yellow flowered plant here and you need 10 of them, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but if it helps you to get some idea of textures, you can see some how they've made the perimeter of those little circles. Um, it's kind of spiky looking. You can see some that will look more like ornamental grasses and all of that you can see in there. And I will make mention too, as you can see, trees are um, just kind of an, a simple outline. And so you can see, um, there's kind of a black dot in the middle that would be representing where the trunk of the tree is um, and there wouldn't be a plant planted there. And then the, the outline would be the canopy of the tree. So that would be indicating that eventually this area would be shady. Um, and that's just kind of giving you some more assistance as you, you draw your, your landscape plan there. So this one was obviously done in, in some computer program um, but you can see um, how the final plan came out. You can easily with this one, because of the spacing of the circles for plants, you can, you can pick any of them just about and go in and start going one, two, three, four, five to get your count of how many you have to purchase. Um, another thing I like about this, you can see they, they have started to name plants, but we haven't talked about named plants quite yet. I think it's possible to have um, for example, if we're looking at the, the bottom right um, plants there that are the blue circles, um, you could have an idea of what you're looking for, or maybe even three or four plants that would work in that area. And then as you take your plan with you to the nursery to purchase plants, you'll know that you know plant A, B, and C would work here. It kind of depends on what you find when you go to the nursery and then what you ultimately end up liking in person the most, because you might not be familiar with all the plants that will work there. Um, so you might know the exact plant you want there, but even just having a general idea. And so you could make a list. Again, if you had three plants that would work there, you know, they're all the same size. We're looking at those light requirements, soil requirements, water requirements as well. You could easily make lists of, of multiple plants for a location. So when you label plants, you can do it that way. Um, or you can just label them as far as I really want to have plumbago here and I know I need 10 to fit the area. The plant is the right plant for the right place based on my soil type um, and just leave it there and then go find the plumbago when you need to find it. So after the plan is done, you can start to look 
um, at plant selection. And we've sent a couple emails with all the, the plant guides and the Polk County plant list. I'll send them again um, after today's workshop. Um, so you can use those for reference for plants. And again, if you're not sure what plants exactly for each space, you can make some short lists based on your criteria. Um, our FloridaYards.org website that's through the State Florida Friendly Landscaping Office has a couple ways you can search. So you can search for plants on that website. Um, and it's a website that correlates right with our plant guide. If you've ever purchased our spiral or um, gotten our spiral plant guide from the office, or I've sent it in a couple of emails from the previous classes um, as download as well. It's those same plants, but you can search in the website um, for uh, butterfly plant, red flowers, that sort of thing. So you could easily make a list just using that website. That would be pretty easy. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a shopping list and you can make a substitute pretty easily. Um, so for example, if we needed a three foot by three foot evergreen shrub for full sun that's drought tolerant, um, can anybody think of a plant that might work for that, that area? If you have any thoughts, you can type them into the chat and we'll see. I bet we get a bunch of different plants that will work in a three by three foot area, full sun, evergreen shrub. Anybody think of any plants? I have a short list that I thought of. Uh, Kunti cycads would work, Indian hawthorn, some of the, some of the junipers would work as well. Um, yep, Kunti, golden dewdrop, the, the, the dwarf variety, yep. So they would be similar, again, drought tolerant, full sun, and you could, you could have a little list for many areas of your landscape, not a, not a problem at all. So don't feel like you're gonna be pressured into thinking of the exact plant <laughs> that you're gonna have you know, forever and ever. Dwarf Walters viburnum, yep, that's another good one. There's some varieties of that one that would work as well. Yep, great. So again, when we're putting it on paper, we need to think back to that inventory that we took. How much, how much room do we have? Um, and we will easily know as far as how much room we have because we have a scaled plan. Um, sun or shade. Flooded conditions, pest susceptibility, um, botanical names are really important. So when it comes to, for example, um, we just got that, that um, uh, idea of a dwarf Walters viburnum. If you're going out to purchase a Walters viburnum and you don't know exactly which variety you're purchasing, you could get anywhere from a plant that, that will grow to four feet to a plant that'll go to 24 feet. So it's important that if you're you know, selecting a certain variety that you know what that is um, and purchase your plants somewhere where they have them accurately labeled so you know you're getting the right thing. And there are so many varieties of plants now, particularly dwarf varieties of plants that will work in a lot of yards. Um, it's really important to have that, that information. And all those plant guides and everything I'm sending out, they all have that information for you. Okay, we also need to know what zone we're in um, so if you're utilizing any of our University of Florida stuff, it is for the entire state. And um, down in the Keys is pretty different from up in Pensacola. So we need to know our zone. Does everybody see it there? If you know what our zone is, you can type that in the chat. So all of our plant guides um, and plant lists that we have, um, because they're from the state, indicate what zone those plants will grow in. Um, if you are unsure when you're an, at a plant nursery, um, you need to double check. So you could, you could either check online um, and look uh, for a source from the University of Florida. Many um, uh, University of Florida fact sheets, um, will we will have individual fact sheets on individual plants. Um, so again, um, say like Sal Palmetto or something like that, we'll have an individual fact sheet on it. And if you're unsure of the zone that it will grow in, you can go on you know, your phone at the nursery and, and look it up and it will say in one of our fact sheets. Um, and we're in zone 9B. Um, we kind of used to be a little bit more divided between 9A and 9B. 
Um, so just looking at this map, we know that um, we shouldn't have any issues growing plants here that grow in zone eight to nine. 10 and 11, depending on where you are, um, you could have issues with freeze. So um, we do like to buy tropical plants. I definitely get it, they're very appealing. Um, but if you're purchasing plants that are hardy in zone 10 and 11, um, there is a chance that it could either freeze back to the ground every year. It may freeze back and come back, but it could freeze back and not come back. Um, another important thing to remember is if you see plants that are labeled zone, um, you know, zone six to eight or six to nine, it all, it could also be a little bit hot here. And those could be plants that continually struggle in the landscape. Um, so you're good picking something zone, you know, eight and nine, that sort of thing will, will grow really well here. We want to make sure, again, we're looking at that mature size of the plant based on um, where we're growing it and planting it. And there's lots of dwarf cultivars of lots of different plants now, particularly next to your, your home, next to driveways. If you're doing any planting of landscape beds next to a walkway or driveway, you probably don't want 20 feet tall plants lining those. Um, so getting that, that mature size is important. And again, you can find that in all of the plant guides and books as well. Um, that's not a problem. So remember when, when we're looking, um, when we talk about form and function, the different plant forms and sizes help you with function. So if we are trying to screen a view, you can kind of see here how you can combine a couple of plants to either screen something. Um, so kind of a natural fence or open up a view as well or preserve a view that you might have. Um, so you may want to, chill, that will kind of make a, um, a difference in if you're selecting a um, larger shade tree and some lower growing plants like the, the picture on the right, or a combination of a, a smaller shade tree and maybe an evergreen hedge, um, like you'll see in the picture on the left. I know lots of people want to select plants to create shade, um, and that's certainly doable. Um, again, looking at that mature size of the plant in relation to your home, as well as the size of your property is pretty important. If you have a pretty small yard um, and, you know, houses are close together around you, you probably don't want to be planting 10 live oaks in your backyard. There are smaller shade trees that could serve a similar purpose. Um, varieties of oaks that might be better suited for you. Um, and then remember that that mature size with your tree is gonna be spread in canopy cover. Um, so you wanna be really cautious with that as well, just from high winds and hurricane issues and, and that sort of thing. All right, so we're gonna end this session here um, going through some inspirational Florida friendly landscapes. And I think the most important thing here is to see they're all very different from each other and remember that as we design our landscapes that a landscape can be Florida friendly and it can look lots and lots of different ways. Um, it all comes down to how it was designed um, and how it's installed and maintained. So the way that it looks is up to, to you and combining it with your home style, your neighborhood style, your personal style, how long and how much you wanna be maintaining it um, and all of those things. Um, this is a quick slide to just show a transformation. Um, and I think this is great. This is in one of our plant guides. So you can see here, um, this is before design and then after design. And you can see the difference there. And um, this is a pretty small property. Um, and you can see just what a difference it made um, removing some of those overgrown plants and I'll go back again so you can see the before again. Um, this is a typical situation that most people have when they're ready to make a change and do, do some landscape design work. And really not a lot has to be done. They did have to remove some things that were overgrown, but that's typically when you decide you need to do a design. You know, wrong plant was planted, now it's too big, now I need to make a change. And you can see that's really enhanced the look of the landscape there weren't a lot of plants 
added. You know, not a lot of crazy stuff was done here, but it really cleaned up the landscape, made it look nice, kind of um, did a really good job combining the landscape with the, the feel of the house. So I think that's a good example there. We've talked a lot um, about um, different heights of plants, ground covers. Lots of people are always looking for um, turf grass alternatives. So what that means is something that will grow low like a, like a, a, a lawn grass would that's not grass. And so in this landscape here, you can see um, in the shady area under the tree, they have grown Asiatic jasmine. Um, and in the sunny part of the yard, they're growing um, a perennial peanut. Um, and so that will grow in full sun. And you can see as they start to grow and mature, they can combine together and you've got your turf grass alternative. This is another really great um, before and after. So this is a situation that uh, I don't know, m most people, many people have between their home and the home next to them. Narrow area, what do you do here? Maybe it's really shady. Maybe you both have irrigation systems that are aimed right at the middle of that landscape and the yard is always sopping wet. I think there's lots of opportunities for homeowners to work together to create something really appealing and low maintenance in between their homes. And you can see here what was done in between. Um, I've been out to many landscapes where, again, what they have just a, a, a sopping wet mess in between because it's low, um, it's irrigated and, and shady. And so um, lawn grass, typically struggles there, but I think these homeowners did a really nice job um, creating a very attractive, very low maintenance landscape in between homes that are pretty close together. This is a, a community that um, did some landscaping. You know, it looks different than what you typically see. The, land, the landscapes are pretty small. Um, but instead of the typical uh, turf grass in kind of the median beds between the sidewalk and the street, they've got ornamental plants in there. So um, you certainly can get creative. I mean, the main point here is you don't wanna have anything too high when you're driving um, so that you can get in and out with, without obstructing a view. But um, there are options, particularly if you have something like this in your neighborhood where there is no irrigation, um, there are lots of really attractive options that you can, you can install in, in those types of areas. Uh, this is another landscape. Again, they are all very different looking. So this one's got a lot of um, flowering plant material in it. Um, lots of uh, hardscapes, ornamental things that are done not with plants. So you can see benches and um, overhangs and uh, a nice walkway and a planter and, and all sorts of things like that. So there's lots going on in this landscape as well. This is a, a, a picture I show in a lot of my programs because again, it's a smaller landscape. Um, another option for turf grass alternative. So Asiatic Jasmine used instead of a typical lawn grass. Um, this is an example. If you have a landscape that's in on any body of water, so it could be stormwater pond, it could be lake, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and that is having plantings along the perimeter of that body of water. So along the whole right of the photo, you'll see lots of ornamental grasses there. And you can certainly have things low enough so that you still have a nice view. Um, but it is important to think about preserving um, uh, your landscape there from erosion. Um, so having a lawn grass right up to the edge, you'll start to lose your lawn uh, pretty quickly to erosion. Um, so this will help stabilize. It'll also, having these plants around the perimeter of, of water bodies, whatever they are, um, will help um, keep that water clean. Um, so if you live on a pond where you, again, have grass to the edge and the pond kind of looks yucky and dirty a lot, they do a lot of spraying, um, simply doing some of this planting around the perimeter will help help with that, that clean water because it'll be absorbing nutrients before it can get into the water and causing things like algal blooms and, and stuff like that. Um, you won't see more or less um, alligator snakes, that sort of thing uh, in either situation. Um, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't cause more of those things to come if you have plants around the perimeter of your pond. 
Um, this is an example of, I've talked before about having, um, if you have a lot of trees or things scattered in the yard, simply doing larger mulch beds around them. And this is one of the examples here. And um, they've just let the, the, the pine straw fall. So this is even a self mulching area. So really, if you've got all these trees here already, just by doing a mulch bed, you don't even have to add any more plants or anything. And it just makes the landscape look a lot neater. Um, in this landscape, you'll see there's um, different mulches combined, a small um, yard area, trees, plants of different heights for wildlife, all kinds of things going on here um, in a mostly green landscape. So you can see a lot of the things we talked about last time with texture and form and all of that. Um, this is another landscape that looks pretty common, except for the fact that um, instead of a turf grass lawn, it has perennial peanuts. So you can see this in a different setting as well. And I know a lot of people enjoy that for a lawn. Conversely, no lawn. So this is a more wooded setting. Um, you can see how, again, the um, neighborhood, the aesthetic of the house and all of that play really um, an important role in the landscape that you're designing. So again, this is a wooded landscape. So that's what they have. Um, they've planted. So they've got a lot of trees, some, you know, native shrubs and, and things like that. And um, uh, natural mulching areas um, in that landscape. Um, this is an example of, um, you can see the front walkway there kind of starting on that right side and then curving back towards the front front door. So typically you're starting off with just the plants on the inside of the walkway, but here you can see how um, it looks when a homeowner decides to create a pretty large mulched bed on what is typically the lawn side of the front walkway. Um, and they've combined lots of existing plant material here. So just building upon what you have and um, increasing the size of that mulched area um, creates a really attractive landscape. Certainly it is, a tr it is uh, possible for um, a typical landscape, a new home build to be Florida friendly. Again, um, right plant, right place, larger planting beds, um, all of those things are pretty important um, in creating Florida friendly. Um, this is a really attractive um, planting bed kind of along the whole uh, length of a driveway. So um, if you have a situation like this where you have maybe um, your lawn right up to the edge of a driveway or walkway and it's, you know, hard to maintain, you, you have a lot of issues, you know, irrigating it. Um, typically that's where we see a lot of chinch bug action. If you have St. Augustine grass would be right along the perimeter of those, those walkways and driveways. Um, this homeowner is just kind of, um, taken all that out and put a long landscaped bed and you can see where they have um, lots of texture, lots of different form from green plant material. There's some rocks and um, there's some small river stones in there so they don't have a lot of washout issues with mulch and things like that. So you can certainly combine um, river rock and small rocks into a landscape uh, in Florida and that will help with some of the, the issues we get from heavy rainfall events. This is actually at that same home on the opposite side of the driveway. And um, this home did start off with um, uh, a lawn in the front and then over the years have taken most of that out. So behind the tree in the landscape is all plant material, very low growing plant material. And then along the driveway on this side and along the street, um, they've, they've um, used uh, Asiatic jasmine for ground cover. And we've seen this done a lot along a driveway, uh, sidewalk, um, street type of situation um, where maybe you've typically had issues um, growing lawn grass before. And this is another shot a little bit closer to the house, but you can see um, how that turf grass alternative works, the lower part of the landscape, and then the size of the plants build off of that as you get taller near the house. And then here you can see this is a commercial landscape. Certainly commercial buildings and landscapes and all of those things can be Florida friendly as well. And it just, again, depends on how you combine the plants here. Um, this, this landscape has a lot of native plants in it. Um, the small lawn area to the left is um, just in a dry retention pond. 
Um, so um, as we look to um, Florida friendly landscaping, it is important to, th to know that um, community centers, um, you know, neighborhood clubhouses, businesses, they can all be landscaped to be Florida friendly as well. And so if you live in a um, neighborhood that has um, common areas or things like that, um, that's something that we can assist with as well. If, if you know, you don't want to go ahead and start doing designs for not only your home, but for the rest of the neighborhood as well. <laughs> 